Good morning, friends. I am grateful to TEDx Deccan for giving this opportunity to share uh, some ideas of hopefully some value to this country. Today I would like to explore the theme of the disconnect between the politics of India and the economics of India. I would, look, I would like to urge all of you to look at politics and recognize that economic growth is not sustainable without political change in this country and all of us have stakes in it, all of us need to be partners in that. If you look at India's economic pattern over the past 2000 years, it's been a steady decline from 33% of the global GDP to today, to, to about 1970s and 80s, 3% in purchasing power terms. Unfortunately, the decline continued post-independence because we have taken up the socialist license permit quota Raj, undermined human initiative. Now things have started changing since 1991 because we have recognized that human freedom is very important and economic growth cannot be ensured without enterprise. As a young official, I joined government with socialist notions. Then after a few years, I recognized that the public sector in India is not really a public institution at all. It is the private sector of those in public office. And that recognition and compulsion rather than conviction in 1991 helped us change course and the results are there for everybody to see. And this is the share of uh, India's trade and global trade. You can see uh, as a percentage of GDP, you can see that we are now reaching 40-50%, sometimes 60% of the GDP in terms of trade. While India is doing reasonably well in economic terms, and there is real hope that we can actually match the great giant of China, and probably exceed America's wealth creation in the next 30-40 years in just one generation's time, there are huge challenges. Our politics has become a challenge. In a sane society, politics must be the answer to our problems. In India, politics has become the problem itself. The challenge is how do you address that? I know that people snigger when they talk about politics. There's a lot of disquiet, there's a lot of frustration. Disraeli once talked about uh, Gladstone. He said, you know, if Gladstone were to fall into River Thames, that would be a misfortune. But if somebody saves him, that is a calamity. I suspect that is the sentiment that we all share about our politicians. And it's not really uh, limited to India. Uh, Reverend Haley, uh, chaplain of the US Senate, was once asked by somebody, he said, Reverend, when you pray every morning in the Senate, do you pray for the senators? He said, oh no, I look at the senators' faces and pray for the country. But it's not always like this. In the first 20 years after independence, India has had seen some spectacular leadership great initiatives and nation building. Look at India of 1940. 534 princely states, you can't recognize where you are. It's an incredible jumble. Actually, this map conceals the magnitude of the, and the complexity of the task. And yet, in just 15 months, Sadar Patel and his colleagues accomplished an unprecedented miracle. 534 states were integrated into Indian Union without a bullet being fired except in the state of Hyderabad. Even there, only five people died in just 15 months. Compared with Italy, nine Italian-speaking provinces of same color, same race, same language, same religion. It took 23 years of great statesmanship and extraordinary effort to unify. You take Germany, nine years of blood and iron by Bismarck to unify 39 German-speaking provinces. And that's not all. The institutions are great leaders built in the first 20 years. Myron Weiner talked about the four postulates of a functioning democracy, competitive elections, peaceful transfer of power, universal political freedoms available to all, real power of the elected governments, not with the military coterie or junta. All these and the institutional underpinnings were developed during that period. And sometimes we underestimate the importance of what has been accomplished. But today, clearly, things are pretty depressing on occasion. Instead of belaboring the symptoms of what's wrong with India, I would like to go into why things are wrong and what can we do about it. But first, 
without changing politics of India, we cannot improve economics of India because these two have to go in tandem. If you want good leadership, integrity in public life, sensible decision making and public policy, reconciliation of conflicts in the country, and prioritization of our limited resources, above all, preserving national unity, all these require passion, they require purpose, they require passion and purpose to be combined with power. And the one word for all these three, passion, purpose and power, is politics. But today, that politics has become dysfunctional. Politician is at the center in this, in this wheel of corruption. You have a citizen, you are the bureaucrat, you are the entrepreneur. Politician, of course, comes to power by vote buying increasingly in this country. And the citizen who takes the money during elections, in turn, is compelled to pay for service delivery, from a birth certificate to a registration of a property deal. And he pays to the entrepreneur by way of shoddy goods and sometimes high prices. Things are better now, but still, shoddy goods and high prices are the norm in a society which is politically corrupt. Then the bureaucrat is placed by a bribe. There is a rent seeking in place. And the bureaucrat, in turn, because he paid the politician huge sums, receives an ext extraction, demands and receives from the citizens for a myriad services. And he also receives from the entrepreneur for the remnants of the license permit raj. And of course, during the LPQ era, license permit quota raj, that was very dominant, but even today we see it. And in this climate of vicious cycle, what Robert Wade called a dangerously stable equilibrium, we have to set things right if we want to restore some sense of normalcy to our political life and if we want to ensure economic growth is sustainable. Because by 2040 or 2050, India could well have about $40 trillion uh, in purchasing power terms of economy, bigger than the United States by that time, or $50 trillion actually by that time. But it's not a manifest destiny of this country. It's something we could accomplish if we do things right today. So what is the problem? What are the obstacles today? One is political recruitment. Look at the members of parliament in this country. Below 30, there's not a single member of parliament who does not belong to a dynasty. Below 40, 65% belong to dynasties. In Congress party, even higher. Now, David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, became Conservative leader at 39. He became Prime Minister at 43. Barack Obama became the President at 46. In India, there is no 40-year-old, or almost no 40-year-old, who does not come from a dynasty. There is no political meritocracy possible in contemporary India. And if you don't change it, if we depend on dynasties today, and if we expect miracles without meritocracy, then we are living in a fool's paradise. Party management, parties therefore became private estates. They are feudal fiefdoms. And vote buying has become endemic because people don't get the delivery. And the politicians have to please the electorate at the time of elections in order to get the vote. And vote buying and liquor has become endemic. And once that happens, again the vicious cycle starts, as we've seen earlier. What can we do? We have to now restore some sanity to our public life. Recently, some good things are happening in the country. The middle class, media, and the youth of all. They have come together to form a coalition to see that some change is possible. This fight against corruption in the recent months after a spate of monumental scandals and what's happening in Karnataka even today are examples of what citizens can do through collective assertion. And I'm reasonably certain that a strong and vibrant Lokpal will come about. But that's not enough because we don't have an institution in the states yet. It's not even contemplated. We have to have such institutions across the board in states and local government. But even that's not enough. Even punishment of the corrupt, while it's necessary, it's not sufficient. We have to look at other things too. Look at these two cities, Sunnyvale and Cupertino. North of that um, home, Homestead Road in Northern California in the Bay Area stands Sunnyvale. Both are identical, these two cities, the infrastructure, the access to public amenities, 
everything is pretty identical. But these are two different cities. The property values in Cupertino are 60% higher than the values in Sunnyvale. If a house of a certain size in Sunnyvale is $300,000, in Cupertino is $500,000. What's the difference? Because in Cupertino, the school district functions very well, the district board, the school board, an elected school board. Therefore, public schools deliver quality education. Therefore, people who have children to send to school are willing to pay taxes in Cupertino rather than in Sunnyvale. And therefore, there's in-migration, the property value. There's a dramatic connect between three kinds of things. What is linked to public good? As opposed to India, where what is not seen to be having any value, and therefore there's a short-term maximization, therefore purchase the vote. Authority is linked with accountability. We have created a system in which authority and accountability are completely disconnected in India. You go to anybody, from a collector of a district, to a, a chief minister, to a minister in the cabinet at the unit level, the prime minister, you go with your problems and complaints, by the time you leave their room, your shirt sleeves are wet with their tears. Because they have so many complaints, there are so many alibis, plausible, realistic alibis for non-performance. Because there's no connect between authority and accountability. And taxes and services are not fused. People are willing to pay higher taxes in Cupertino because they find better services in the form of education which they value enormously. That's what we need to do. Restructure government, empower citizens in a manner that these three things are linked, but with accountability. The second is, of course, rule of law. Unless we bring in a system of rule of law where high and mighty are equal to the ordinary citizens, might is not right. We will not be able to build a kind of democracy which facilitates growth in the country. Because rule of law is the bedrock on which the markets function. In 1924, in the then Britain, there was a very infamous episode called Campbell episode. Campbell was accused of spying. The British government and Ramsay MacDonald, it interfered in the crime investigation. It decided to drop the charges and instructed Scotland Yard to follow suit. There was such an uproar in the country that the government had to resign. The House of Commons was dissolved. Elections had to be held again. For the past 87 years, since 1924, there was not a single instance in British history when a member of parliament or a minister or the government ever dared to interfere in crime investigation. Not one solitary instance. In India, probably not a day passes without an MP or a minister interfering in the investigation of a crime in any police station in this country. You obviously cannot have a functioning democracy which facilitates growth and prosperity without rule of law. That means police reform, that means judiciary. Making judiciary work, it's not enough to have normative judiciary. It's important to actually make judiciary function and encourage us to go to courts. Right now, many of us repel from going to courts because we know that it takes a lifetime if you're lucky to get a judgment. And even then, those who lose, they lament in public, in court, and those who win, they come back home and lament in private because both of them suffer a tragedy. That needs to be changed. And the third is political reform. At the end of the day, politics drives everything. We require people of high quality coming in. We require people who want to decentralize power, not to accumulate power. We require people who deliver services better. We require people actually make institutions function. People who stand for privacy, for integrity, to fight corruption, and to ensure that there's a level playing field for every single child in this country. But that means all of us must play a role. We need two players, a new crop of leaders, who will recognize that economic prosperity cannot be sustained with the kind of 19th century antediluvian politics that we have. Our dreams of a great India, a resurgent India, are real. They're realistic. We can accomplish that dream only if we actually change the nature of politics. But if we don't play that role, if we allow recruitment of the kind that happens in this country, the dynasties, the gundas, and the money bags, politics as business, if that continues, we pay a heavy price. The notion that economic growth can be 
autonomous of political evolution is a very dangerous one. We have to transform this country. Change will happen whether we like it or not. When status quo is unsustainable, change is inevitable. The choice is, do we have to, do we fight for the right kind of change that we desire? Or do we get the kind of change that we get anyway and then suffer the consequences? Let me conclude with one anecdote. 20 years ago, in the then Soviet Union, there was this problem. In Moscow City, I believe there was a long queue in front of a ration shop in the bitter cold of Moscow. They waited for two, three hours, there was no bread in sight. One young man lost his temper and he said, look, I'm sick and tired of what's happening. We have the ability to decimate the whole world with a nuclear arsenal, but we have no bread at home. I'll go and kill the general secretary in Kremlin. Well, the others waited patiently still. They were afraid of the midnight knock. This young man came back after two hours. They all gathered on him and asked him, what happened? Have you killed the general secretary? He said, oh no, I could not kill him. I went there to kill him, but there was a much longer queue waiting. People laughed harmlessly at this joke, but they did not act in time collectively to build the country of their dreams. Change did happen eventually, not the kind of change that they wanted, the change they had to endure. A nation was broken up into 15 fragments. A civilization collapsed. An economy lay in ruins. We deserve something better for our kids. And that cannot happen without transforming politics and without helping our economy to prosper without giving an opportunity to every single child. I believe our generation has this obligation and this fantastic opportunity to transform this country and its future and give our children a nation of which they can be justly proud. I wish you all the very best.